This is your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 285. Welcome to Your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug. Because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Welcome back, everybody. We are on episode three of the six part series. And if you have listened to the previous episodes, I am sure you are just full of information, but hopefully ready to hear some more. Today, we have Dr. Jonathan Grayson. He is here to talk about his specific way of managing mental compulsions. As you may know, if you've listened before, I strongly urge you to start and go in order. So first we started with Mental Compulsions 101. That was with yours truly, myself. Then John Hirschfeld came in. He talked about mindfulness and really went in and gave some incredible tools. Sharla nicely, again, gave some lived experience and really the tools that worked for her. And I have just been mind blown with both of their expertise. And it doesn't stop there. We have amazing Dr. Jonathan Grayson today talking about all of the ways that he manages mental compulsions and how he brings specific concepts to help a client be motivated and lean into those um, that response prevention and to reduce those mental compulsions. So I am, again, blown away with how amazing and respectful and kind and knowledgeable these experts are. I just am overwhelmed with joy to share this with you. Again, please remember this should not replace professional mental health care. We are here at CBT School, who is the host of this series. We're here to provide you skills and tools and resources, specifically if you don't have access to those resources. That is a huge part of our mission. So even though we have ERP school and that is an online course, you can take it from your home. We wanted to offer this freely because so many people are seeming to be misunderstanding mental compulsions. And it's an area I really have been excited to share with you in this free series. So I'm not going to yammer on anymore. I'm going to let you hear the amazing wisdom of Jonathan Grayson. Have a wonderful day. Well, welcome. I am so honored to have you here, John Grayson. It is always a pleasure. Okay. So I actually am really, really interested to hear your point of view. As we go through a different episode, I actually am learning things I thought I knew at all, but I'm learning and learning, so I'm so excited to get your view on managing mental compulsions or how you address them. My first question is, do you call them mental compulsions, mental rituals, rumination? How do you frame it? You know, I'm never really too big on on jargony, but but mental mental compulsions are mental rituals, you know, Mm -hmm. anything that's trying to, you know, and, and I think the thing about mental rituals is some people don't know they have them. I mean, some people know, but some people will describe it as I just obsess, I don't have rituals, but then when you listen, they do. And, you know, the ritual part is the trying to reassure themselves or convince themselves that, you know, whatever it is they're worrying about isn't, you know, so they kind of have both the fear part, like, oh my God, what if this is true? But wait, here's why it's not true. It's like, no, I know that's not really true, but what if it is true? And that, you know, so that, that, that is what I would call mental compulsions or rituals. How do you, let's say you're sitting across from a patient or a client, they are doing either predominantly mental compulsions or that's a huge part of the symptoms that they have. How would you address in your way, own way, some, you know, teaching somebody how to manage mental compulsions? I, I think there's two answers to the question because I never have one. And um, one has to do with what is the content? Because I believe every set of mental rituals 
I believe it for all forms of OCD, whether there's a very strong behavioral component or it's all mental, it has its own set of arguments that we're going to use. And of course, when I talk about arguments, I know this will be a shock to you, but you know, to me, to me, it always has to do with coping with uncertainty, because I think I think the purpose of mental compulsions is to deny reality. That is, you know, there's something I don't want to be true. And I keep trying to convince myself it's not true. Now, often it's a low probability, but low probability is not no probability. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I have clients a little confused or saying like, I, I tell myself it's low probability and they actually feel better. And is that, is that okay? And the answer is, it depends. If I'm trying to convince myself, I don't have to worry about it because it's low probability. No, that's a ritual. If I'm just saying it's low probability, I mean, way, actually with OCD, it's very easy because people don't mind saying it's low probability. They, they like saying it's low probability, but they don't want the last sentence to be, but it might happen. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, as long as you're answering it might happen, yeah. uh, then you're dealing with reality you know, mm -hmm. because everything is a low probability, uh, even if it's really small. So one part has to do with the content. And I think for every set of obsessions, there is what is the content they're doing. I think in a more general way, the goal of treatment is is basically accepting that low probability things might happen. Uh, you know, I was recently saying to people that I thought the probability of nuclear war was uh, no worse than that. You know, it was, was, was about as likely as a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> so some people would freak out. It's like, you think there's going to be a war? First of all, like, I know anything. But they were missing the point. Yeah. It's like, no. I really mean it's as likely as a pandemic, which means it's not likely. However, the thing about the pandemic, but low probability things can happen. So yeah. you know, we're probably okay. Mm. And, um, you know, so the thing about acceptance that everyone hates is acceptance is second best. You know, we spend so much time talking about how great acceptance is. And I really think it's a disservice in some respects to not point out what acceptance means because it almost always is here's something you don't want that you might have to live with. You know, if I lose the loved one, we start in denial. And, and for me, denial is defined as I'm comparing life to a fantasy. You know, so I have a woman in a bad relationship and she thinks she really loves the guy, but it's like, you know, he'd be so good if only he would change X, Y, and Z. And of course, if he changed X, Y, and Z, he would be someone else. So they're in love with a fantasy. You know, um, and when somebody dies, the fantasy is life would be better if they were here. And it's a fantasy because that's never happening again. Um, you know, so we have to get them to the point. And of course, the thing, the reason I mentioned death is it points out a really important thing about acceptance. You don't get to just decide I'm going to accept. I lose a loved one. I don't care how or where you are. You're starting in denial. So you're missing them and you want them there. And after about a year, if you've gone through mourning, you accept it. It's not like you don't care they're gone. You can still cry. You can still miss them. But when you're doing something, you're enjoying it in the present, not comparing to what it would be with that person. So acceptance, I'm pretty sure, always sucks. However, it's better than fantasy because the fantasy is never happening. You know, so what? So it doesn't matter if it's likely or unlikely. It just matters that this is your fear, and the thing that's hard for people to deal with fear is to cope with it. You're going to say, "How would I try to live with the worst happening?" You know, and people's initial response to something is, "Yeah, but I don't want that." Like, okay, there are multiple reasons that we need to do acceptance. If I'm correct about denial, as comparing reality to fantasy, well, non-acceptance means what I want will never happen. You know? So for me to want that there's no possibility something will occur is probably not true. I don't care if it means that maybe this reality doesn't exist and I'm going to wake up and some other thing to discover I've created all of reality, there's nothing. I don't know that that's likely, but I can't prove it's not likely. 
you know, and so the people, so I think people go in circles and you can hear, you know, the great thing, well, the great thing, the thing about the pandemic, you could hear the regular population denial. Because when I say it's comparing reality to fantasy, a lot of times, you know, that sounds cool and people don't quite get that what it means, but here's statements of denial early in the pandemic. Well, this can't go on more than a few weeks. Honestly, at the beginning, I was like, of course it's going on for New Year week. They have to have a vaccination. They're telling us that's two years down the road. Like, this is going on for a long time, you know. It I was last- totally, I was in team two weeks. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it can't last all, I can't take it. Saying I can't take it, you know, although you're expressing a feeling like I really hate this, but included in the words I can't take it is a fantasy as if you have a choice. And, and in a way, Luckily, most people who say they can't take it didn't kill themselves as proof that they can't take it, right? They took it. They kept going on. It's like they didn't want to imagine continuing to live that way, right? So acceptance is like, yeah, this is going to happen. Yes, it can keep going. How will you try to cope with the worst? Go on, I'll shut up. You look like you want to say something. No, no, I, I, I'm following you. I'm really enjoying this. And I have actually wrote down the word cope right at the beginning because I think that that's such a key word here to stay out of the fantasy, would you say? Would you say that's true? Like to help yeah. me to... Well, well, to, 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 yes, the worst might, you know what? I mean, I always feel like if I'm doing therapy and somebody's afraid, somebody, you know, if, if somebody has intolerance, uncertainty, they don't like uncertainty. I have to treat that problem, okay? And what I mean by that is we have a lot of therapists who impose their own feelings on the client. If I have a therapist and I have somebody who's socially anxious and they're saying, I'm afraid if I go in a room, some people won't like me. Almost every therapist is gonna say, oh, well, that's the fact, they might not like you. But that same patient's like, I'm afraid if I touch the doorknob, I'm gonna get sick. Oh no, that won't happen. Well, that's not the issue. I'm now, now the therapist is, you know, if I have a, if I have a problem of threat estimation, that's fine, but that's not it. I don't want, I want to know, I don't want to know that it's a low probability. I want no probability. So, you know, we have to deal with the fact that, you know, this is what the person's afraid of. This is what they fear. You know, it's like, you know, some people say, well, but they don't have cancer. So why, why should they worry about it? But let's face it, if they did have cancer, The focus would be coping with the fact they're dying. And if they're afraid of having cancer, I'd say the treatment's the same. Now, the only great thing is, you know, they probably won't have cancer, so it's not a fear they will have to probably deal with. They they won't have the second part of it is like, and I'm dying. But to be more prepared, um, and, and I think what you've done wisely, I like hearing that, yes? What you've done wisely is, you know, you're talking about the fact that this it's not just no C problem. This is a problem for everyone, coping with uncertainty. And so and I hate, to, I, I hate to do a plug. It's okay. It, it's a while away. I, actually, Liz McIndale and I, we're working on a book mm. talking about, um, well, we're, the, the book is partially, and we'll be doing some talks on it, that we're saying that ERP is not the gold standard of treatment for OCD. And we're going to say that it's not the gold standard because it's lacking the gold. It really needs to be ERP plus gold. But, you know, that's kind of awkward because I like to be cool and use initials. So we want to use initials. Do you know, happen to know the uh, chemical symbol for gold? F, no, that's F-E is copper. No, that's iron. Yeah, iron. Uh, yeah, yeah. A-U. A-U. So the gold standard of treatment. Like Australia. Is, well, no. <laughs> it's ERP plus A-U. A-U as in accepting uncertainty. Oh, mic drop, mic drop. <laughs> yeah, it took me a while to work that around. But, you know, I, I had to Are you sure it's it. not Australia? <laughs> but, 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 um, but our point is, in, in the, what we want to write, we want, we want to write a book that's not only about helping therapists deal with every presentation of OCD and how you deal with the uncertainty problem, but we're also arguing that it's a book for everyone that people can learn from OCD, a disorder that intolerance and uncertainty is like the core, because I always feel that our clients who get better, they're they're not normal. They are better than normal because they're coping with uncertainty because the average person 
really doesn't do that well. I mean, in the pandemic, you got to see how bad non-sufferers are. So I think the core of, of coping with mental obsessions is this, well, what if the worst happens? You know, and so many people that I don't want to think it, you know, and, and that leaves us stuck because we're not stupid. You know, if you say to, you know, somebody, if, if, if you get a phone call from, you know, police and they say your spouse has died, your first response is like, you're like just in this shock and you're just like frozen. And for a lot of things that are bad, that's the way people stop thinking. It's like, you know, what if this, ha- I, I don't want to think about it. The thing is, if the police make that call, something happens next, you know, and, and life goes on. And in fact, for clients, I'll often ask that in a sneaky way. Well, what if this did happen? What would be next? You know, like, what if you did have, you know, the doctor says you have cancer, I'd freak out. What, what does that look like? I, I'd, be, I'd be screaming. Okay, you're in the doctor's office screaming. How long are you going to do that? You know, and then, you know, are you going to go home and eat dinner? What do you do the next day? And even though we're now going through something that sounds terribly scary, people oddly feel better after that. Now, this is first session. It's not like they're like done treatment, but they feel better because a statement that is true. You can't do what you won't imagine. And I don't mean this as you would say in the flowers and unicorns kind of way that you can do anything you can imagine. I do not mean that. But if you won't even imagine it, you can't do it. So when when you have what would you do in X situation, the person's like, no. Well, it's like the world is ending. When we imagine it, it's not like it's good, but it's like, oh, because the feeling that accompanies acceptance is a down depressing feeling. Like, oh, that could happen. However, it's not frantic, right? Denial is frantic. That can't happen? No, no. And, you know, if you were, you know, you, again, everything at least has some low probability. Some things are kind of higher. You know, you could have cancer. Yes, your, your family could die. Those things are like, they're there. So it's not like I get the choice. So the statement of denial is frantic. The statement of acceptance is kind of depressing. But it's not frantic. You know, and so I don't care how bad the disaster is. How would you try to cope? Because in most realities, that's what you're going to do. You know, so then I, I and you know, I could pause at this moment because, you know, I don't know if this would be the point where I would then be shifting to, well, what are the mental compulsions we're talking about here? Because I think, again, each one yes. has its own set of arguments. Um, you, you've heard my general thing, you know, and and, and I think... In some ways, I think I'm reasonably good at applying it to myself. I think there's some areas I haven't been tested in, so that's nice. I hope I could be, you know, I know what I want is possible because I've seen people do it. Would I be one of those good people? I can only hope. But, uh, you know, at least because I know people have done it, I know it's possible. Hey everybody, it's Kimberly here. Sorry to interrupt your show. I just wanted to remind you that this free six-part series is hosted and sponsored by cbtschool.com. Head on over to cbtschool.com. You'll get incredible, compassion-focused resources for obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorders, and body-focused repetitive behaviors. We have tons of free trainings. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter that sends you weekly resources and skills. We have a whole study vault of online courses and so much more. So head over to cbtschool.com for more information and let's get back to the show. What does that look like? Like, can you paint me a picture of a client who does well using this strategy at managing mental compulsions? A client that I, uh, that there's a podcast on that the OC stories, he was afraid of going crazy. And uh, he had had this from age 19 to his late 40s. And he had ERP, but the ERP was always focused, like, you know, we're going to focus on going crazy and all this stuff. No one ever explicitly said to him, the goal of treatment is for you to risk going crazy. 
I told him that the first session and, and, and he, he, he began to cry because he's been spending more than 30 years trying to avoid this. And I'm saying, oh, yeah, this might happen. And many people really are able to accept. And I never talk about accepting uncertain. I talk about learning to accept uncertain because really, if I, if, I, if I can talk to you, if it's just a decision, right, we're done the first session. But most people are convinced of a recession. It took about three months to help convince him, you know, and, and he kept going back and forth, you know, and, and so, so convincing him, you know, we went through a number of, of things to work on it. So I'm describing it quickly so it sounds simple, but remember, like three months. You know, the first reason, and this is true of almost all rituals, mental compulsions, regardless, you didn't have a choice. All your rituals do not prevent you from going crazy. You know, he's avoiding places because he's got an anxiety attack there, so I'm not going to go there. It's like, sorry, it's a biological process. If you're going crazy, that's doing nothing. So one is your rituals don't work. Two, for pretty much anything, you don't have a choice. Uncertainty is the fact of life. Um, we talked about what it would look like if he went crazy. Um, and, and we're going to, you know, and, and you know, we talked about like, well, what's going to happen? You know, where are you going to go? And we went through all these things. And because he's logical, at some point it's like, it could happen. You know, and, and, and at that point, he's then able to spend the other work, which is, you know, not fun, which is then imagining going crazy and looking at all the kind of things that scare the heck out of him so he could begin to function again. You know, we wanted to treat growing crazy the way most people, if this is not their problem, treat getting main paralyzed and disfigured in a car crash. We all know it's possible. Our brilliant plan is generally, I hope it doesn't happen. I'm not dealing with it till I'm bleeding out, crushed under the metal. To say, I'm not gonna be in a car accident today, it's like, really? I can't say that. So, you know, our goal is to get, you know, whatever uncertainties in life there are to be like that. And it doesn't matter whether I'm afraid of going crazy, I'm afraid that I'm going to be a pedophile, I'm going to slice and dice my wife tonight, I'm going to flunk the test. These people don't like me. It doesn't matter what it is. It's still always the same. You know, I mean, we can talk about odds, but not as, um, not as simply reassured, because again, it's reassurance if I want to know it's low odds, but if I want it to not be possible, it's not reassuring. You know, it's like, it's probably not this, but it might be. How we deal with it is that way. You know, the other thing that we look at is how does it work for you to fight against this uncertainty? What are you losing? You know, and of course, the more pathological the problem is, the worse it is. So if I have OCD, it could be destroying my life. I'm, I'm not only hurting myself, I'm hurting my family. Let's go how you're really torturing everybody, you know. And, and, and sometimes I think in that case, you know, if we're looking for reasons to get better, I always like people to look at all the harm they're doing to themselves and their family, you know? And, and I think in a, in a brilliant way, just to plug you, I think your book, your new book, like really partially addresses that because the self-compassion part isn't just like, okay, be nice to yourself, stop suffering. It's like, if you're going to love yourself, what kind of life do you want to make for yourself? You know, what are your values going to be? Because I think we transform this process of coping into something more than simply confronting fear. You know, it, it you know becomes something for myself. And secondarily, not as preferable, but sometimes easier to get to, it becomes not only confronting a fear, it becomes an act of love. Because you know what? I'm going to stop. No, true. I'm going to stop being a pain in the ass to my family. I'm I'm now going to put all of us first, and you know, so so we're really going to have what are my values, and how does this interfere with my values? And and again, it, it doesn't have to be as major as I'm, you know, dysfunctional, torturing my family with something OCD for any worry. Um, everybody's going to be happier if I can cope with my worries better. You know, I mean, my family is going to be happier because they love me. It's really nice to see me not freaking out, you know, because they don't have, you know, because you want to help and like there's no way to help, you know. So for me to be like, well, you know, better and calmer and coping is nice for them. 
it's certainly nice for me. And isn't that what I would prefer in life? You know, and so when, when my life depends on me having a worry that's not allowed to happen, I don't get to enjoy things. Another coping thing I do that's smaller is I will ask people to notice what they're enjoying, no matter how, but, but at whatever level, even 5%. But I think many times people will say like, everything sucks, I don't enjoy anything because of this problem. Now that's not entirely true because in the course of interviewing them, there are a few times I'll get them to laugh for three seconds. And I admit, if laughing three seconds were the goal, wow, that'd be great, but three seconds of laughter isn't much compared to a life of misery. But the thing is, they don't even notice that ever. Yeah. Because the entire experience has been horrible. And it's like, you know, and to get them to notice not what it should be, but what it was. I once did this with a guy, I sent him to the movies and I said, you know, watch the movie. Just tell me whatever you enjoyed. I don't care how little. And he came back and he said, it didn't work. Everything was horrible. I'm like, okay. Now tell me about the movie. So he was describing the movie to me. It was a war movie. And it is clear this guy liked the climax. So I'm like, so that, that was pretty, that was, <laughs> isn't that, that was, funny the way our brain works? Yeah. And I said, that, that was pretty cool, that climax. Yeah. Are you sorry you saw that? No. I said, okay. You didn't do my assignment. I said, notice whatever you enjoy. I, I don't care that it's not as good as it should have been. You clearly like that. And, and it makes a difference because it means a two-hour experience that he comes away believing he had nothing. It would be a slight change to go like, I enjoyed a little bit of that. You know, I try to tell people, think of it as like a little island of enjoyment that you don't notice exists. And we want to expand those. Right. And, and most people would recognize that in a way what we're talking about is a little bit of mindfulness, like, like, OK, it sucks. I'm not arguing it doesn't suck. But, you know, a lot of mindfulness, right, isn't like I'm going to put you in happy land. It's like we were trying to do and not or, you know, the beginning of the pandemic, Kathy and I were out on our pandemic walk. And uh, she said to me, you know, this would be such a great day if all this wasn't going on. And I said, you're wrong, Kathy we should let you and your listeners know, well, you don't know this, but your husband does, uh, being married to a psychologist, not necessarily fun. And um, <laughs> so said, true. it is a beautiful day. Like we're walking together, it's beautiful. We're together, it is beautiful. It is a beautiful day and it sucks that there's a pandemic. Mm, so it's true. not or, it's and. and. And in a sense, mindfulness is teaching us to live in that world of and. This is awful and I can still enjoy stuff right. as opposed to it's either or. And again, some people go like, well, that's awful. And that's perfectly true because that we're going back to what is acceptance. Mm -hmm. Acceptance sucks. It's the second best life. Mm -hmm. However, however, what's really great about the second best life, the first best doesn't exist. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's second best, but it's this or nothing. So I think those are the, you know, a lot of the principles of doing it. And, and I think to do it, it's like, why would I take this risk? I mean, it's not a risk, but essentially it's like, why would I accept living like this, whatever this is? Yeah. And, you know, I don't have a choice. What am I losing not living like this? And, uh, you know, am I hurting my family? What would life be like if I could be okay with this? You know, depending who you are, that's an incredibly amazing change or it's a minor change, you know? I mean, if I'm a if I'm very competent worrier, very successful, we're talking about way more peace, you know? But if I'm, you know, competent, but I'm, you know, sitting here being my life and taking up a lot of time, okay, we're now making major changes in the yeah. quality of life. You know, and, and, and as you know, I can obsess or worry about anything from like, I need to be the best, you know, and I always ask people, what is so good about best, you know, because God forbid you should be mediocre. God forbid you should be a happy, mediocre person than the best person, you know, and, um, you know, so, so for well, some that's still a piece of denial, isn't it? Like they have this idea that the best is no pain. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's yeah, no pain yeah. at the top. Yeah, well, I mean, gener yeah, right. And generally, there's some other assumption that 
I don't know, somehow I'm deficient of I'm not best. So it's like the only yeah. way I can know. But, you know, so it's another set of issues. Like, you know, why is it, you know, what is it that I fear that I have to cope with? Right. You know, not being best. Okay, I get you want to be best. Why? Yeah, well, best is best. It's like, you know, I mean, it's nice, I guess. Right. You know, I generally think, um, you know, when I think about being well known, I generally think of being well known as icing. That is what makes my life great for me. I love what I'm doing. Mm. And what I'm doing is, uh, besides talking a lot, because I love talking, but I like working with people. And I just really enjoy it. I have no plans on retiring because I like this too much. That's almost all year round. Being famous and well known, that's about six days a year mm. you know, when I go to conventions. And I say it's like icing to indicate I am weak enough. I'll admit I'm weak enough to really enjoy it. But I also recognize it is nothing. Mm. You know, it, it doesn't have any substance. You know, and the thing about fame, you're always going to lose it. You're never famous enough. And there's a poem by Shelley that I think really characterizes it. It's, uh, it describes a traveler in an ancient land. He's come across a huge fallen monument. And he's describing the magnificence of what this had been. And he comes to the base of the statue where these words are written. My name is Osmondi, is king of kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. That's fame. It's mm -hmm. empty. So I can gorge, but it's like doesn't mean anything because what I enjoy is what I actually do. Right. It'd be, sad, it'd be sad if my life was, you know, like it's good six days a year when I can feel it. Right. And I think what's important, particularly for the sufferer, is you still have uncertainty in your life. I, I don't know any way to be certain. So right. I know nothing. Right. You know what I was reflecting on, and this is just me reflecting, is I am um, last year, maybe it was the beginning of this year, I, I gave myself the exercise to catch the mini toddler tantrums that showed up in my mind. Mm, mm. I right. love that term. Great, right. great. Yeah. Did you make that up? I, I think I did because it take feels- credit, Take credit. It's great. It feels like a it. toddler tantrum in it's my perfect. mind. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's that, I, but I don't want that. Yeah. I love it. Oh, I yeah. love it. Go on. I'm yeah. Sorry. I did a whole podcast about it last year because I was just noticing- toddler tantrum after toddler tantrum and i regulate myself really well yeah, yeah. but it I'm was showing yeah. it was showing up and then as you're talking i'm thinking about how that was me resisting acceptance right mm -hmm. like that toddler tantrum is probably where i have the option to pull out of rumination and be present right when i can catch it and be like okay yeah. you're totally in denial like you're in a you know, fantasy land. And so that really speaks to me in as like a way to catch when you're up mm -hmm. in that place of rumination. Oh, um, perfect. Yeah. 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 I, th for me, that was really powerful. I love that you brought that up because I think that is the bridge up. Oh, I'm totally out of acceptance when I'm in a toddler tantrum. Right. Right. Cause there's that, you know, when, when you get better as you're describing, you can feel that pull of like, this is what it is. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it, you can feel that like, pull back and yes. forth because you don't get completely lost it's like oh. yeah yeah it's it was so it was such a visual i could see it ta tantruming out yes, no yes, no no yes. like and so i i love that you sort of brought that in particularly in this way like i said of catching the compulsion um mm -hmm. so thank you that actually consolidated well, you, you know the uh i'm i'm, I'm just you know now obsessing about how I'm going to work this in. <laughs> we'll give you credit. But, you do, yeah. The Kimberly Quinlan toddler tantrum. I'm, yes, I, yes. I'm very well known for it now. <laughs> uh, no, I'm so thankful for you for bringing all this up. Is there, because I want to be respectful of your time, is there anything else that you want to address when it comes to conceptualizing or managing mental compulsions? I think that I'm afraid I have to be patient. Again, thinking about death, mm. I don't get to accept just because I want to. You have some people who try to accept, like I'm accepting and I'm accepting it. It's like, yeah, sorry. I can I can be working towards learning it. You know, I think sometimes people will have an insight and insight is not like you suddenly know some new piece of information. Insight is something that you basically knew, suddenly it's true. Mm. 
You know, I said somebody, I had somebody have that the other day with uncertainty, and it's kind of, you know, and they, they, they felt like it was trivial trying to explain to me what happened, but, but I already had this concept. I said, I know, it's like you've always known, but like, like you feel like going around, no, you don't get it. It's really true. <laughs> you know, so it was, so it was, it was, it was very cool for them. Yeah. You know? And, and so I think it's a gradual process, you know, where I, I get better at it. And, um, and because life is completely uncertain in every which way, there's always opportunities to practice it yeah. you know, that are personal. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, you may scare other people. You know, I had one client who, who was very scared of, of a lot of things, especially of, one of their pet dying. And as they got uncertain, their pet's old, you know, and then they could talk about it pretty calmly. People, oh, yeah, I think she's going to die at some point. And people would be like horrified. She could be, sound so calm. But, you know, she was like, not that she likes it and she really, you know, doesn't yeah. want it to happen, but she could also think about it and think about life after that. And I think some people mistakenly will say something like, oh, my God, you're making life like completely miserable. All you're thinking about is all these nightmares that can happen all the time. And like, that's terrible. So that's crazy because I thought I'd use a clinical term <laughs> because what happens when I accept uncertainty? And, and somebody else has said this, so unfortunately I haven't made it up. I become in a positive way, hopeless. And what I mean by hopeless is the way most people who aren't scared of the car crash are. It's not like, I'm okay with a car crash. It's like, well, what can I do? And when I become hopeless about control, that is when I get to live in the present, you know, because I'm, I'm no longer in the past or the future. Because let's face it, the truth is that's all we have, right? The, we have, you know, the past are great memories or terrible memories. The future's hopes. All we have is the present. You know, at this moment, my entire life and your entire life is each other. Everything else we like, might not be there at this moment. So I, I get to have the only thing there is, which is the present. And again, I can't just decide, because you see people do this, I'm gonna live in the present. I'm gonna enjoy the present now, enjoy the present. It's like, I have to learn to give things up. Uh, and, and to steal from this uh, woman who wrote this book of compassion, you know, to be kind to myself, to let myself learn. To not expect it all at once, yeah. you know. Uh, and again, if we were if we were talking OCD, I don't know why we were talking about that. If we were talking about OCD, every particular variation has its own uncertainties to cope with. Scrupulosity, you know. How do I learn to believe in a God and simultaneously admit I might be wrong? How do I live in a world where now, probably I'm not going to slice and dice khaki tonight, but if I do, how would I try to, re what would I do the next day? When my son was um, like 16 and going out on dates, and uh, of course he would never be home on time, and Kathy always wanted to call him. And I wouldn't let her call him, not to be nice to him, but I knew, as she knew, his cell phone would be on. So calling somebody you're worried about in their cell phone on is not going to be comforting. So she'd kind of go like, well, when can I call him? So I'd make this mental calculation. Okay, he should be home now. I think he'll be home in this many minutes. And let me add another half hour. I'd say, you can call him then. And she'd go to, you know, for some reason, which is unusual for her, she would then go to sleep. And I would go there and I'd think, huh, he's probably okay. He's probably not doing anything terrible. Probably nothing terrible is happening to him. But... Tonight could be the night that our lives change and everything is screwed up forever. And then I would go to sleep. That's just the truth. Yeah. It's powerful. I'll be calling you when my kids are teenagers saying, coach me, coach me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I will give you the following advice. <laughs> it gets so much easier when you're 23. Yes. I until, hope so. then, until you know your acceptance is oh yeah you're screwed until then <laughs> it's true it's true i'm so grateful for you and your time really and all your wisdom i feel like i'm sitting and just absorbing it all for myself which i'm loving oh, thank um, you 
tell us, I know you've been on the podcast before, but tell us where people can hear more about you and your work. You obviously have a new book, which I did not know about. Well, well we, we we're working on it and, and we're, we're at the stage of like working at not procrastinating. Mm. Uh, we were at the stage of uh, doing a bunch of presentations on the idea because I've just seen so many treatments fail because they didn't address uncertainty because you know, although I always focus on certainty, you know, it, it really is it, it, the, the bottom part of dealing with that is, is coping with life. Yeah. You know, it transcends OCD. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. What would you like to know about me? Where can people find you? Where can people find me? Easily on the internet. The website is uh, laocdtreatment.com. And, um, but I think my name plus OCD tends to come up a lot, you know, and, and, uh, your book, I have a book. Yes. Freedom from OCD. You know, I think there are a lot of good OCD books, you know, of course I like mine because I agree with it most, <laughs> but you know, it's a little scary when people read it before they see me because it is almost my entire repertoire minus maybe about 40 minutes. Uh, I feel like I'm going to be repeating myself, but somehow that doesn't seem to be a problem. No, you know, not apparently, a problem. Okay. Apparently hearing it out loud is different than reading it. So, yeah. Well, and that's the whole point, right? Is I have the same situation as people need to hear it more than once too, in some cases, not as a form of reassurance, but you know, that that's, yeah. I think they need it. We all need to hear it. You know, even me today having a little light bulb moments, I think is really cool, even though I've heard that before. So I will have your website and your book in the show notes. Um, Very kind. Thank you so much for being here and sharing. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you figured it out yet. I know I've told you this, but, you know, I'll just repeat it. You know, I probably if you ask me to come on, the answer will always be yes. You know, so. so I, yeah. So thank you. I'm so happy. No, I remember you saying that last time. And when, like I said to you before we started recording, I have wanted to do this series for quite a while. Yeah, and I always brilliant. had you right there going, I already put you on the list because I already knew you told me you would say yes. <laughs> and and uh, so apparently I'm not dishonest or not that dishonest. Not at all. When I when I texted to ask you, I actually was already had you on the list and scheduled you in. <laughs> It, it was a confidence that you could well have. Yeah, I'm so grateful. And yes, you will definitely have you on. It's always a pleasure. All right. Okay. Take care. Thank you very much. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com. Thank you.